So, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, George Palocrasas from Watson Farley and Williams. And today I will be moderating a panel regarding decarbonization, which follows on very closely to what we discussed, what was being discussed in the, in the previous panel. Um, and it is a, clearly a topic uh, which is very topical and at the top of the, the agenda, not only within the shipping industry, but also um, we can see it in the overall political agenda across the world. Uh, today, the, the panelists joining me are Yorgos Plevraikis, Director of the Global Sustainability Center of ABS, Andreas Hadzipetru, the Managing Director of Columbia Ship Management, uh, Yason Stefanatos, Business De Development Manager of DNVGL, Jeff Prebor, of International, the CFO of International Seaways, Michalis uh, Padazopoulos, the Managing Director of the Liberian Registry, and Ioana Prokopiu, the CEO of Prominence Maritime. I would like to start the um, discussion, which will, which will be fairly broad-ranging, really initially looking at the steps which are being taken to prepare the industry for the, the changes being proposed by the IMO uh, with, the, with the targets of uh, 2030 and then 2050. And looking initially at the technologies which are being considered, whether hydrogen-powered ships, ammonia, LNG, LPG, and you know, partly this was discussed previously, and to, you know, to get an idea of, of how effective these proposals are in reducing emissions, and also the, the, the risks or difficulties which, are, which can be anticipated in implementing the use of these technologies. I, if I could start with Mr. Prevlakis. Thank you. Um, that's a very interesting question, and it actually creates a good link to the previous discussion. Yeah. So I hope they didn't steal our wind there. But um, how do we prepare? Um, and looking at the technologies available, one would note that um, they do not all exhibit the same maturity rates. So, um, Mr. Paolo Gras, as you mentioned, hydrogen, ammonia. Uh, the previous panel uh, touched upon LNG a bit. Um, not all of them are ready to go. And not all of them uh, exhibit the same maturity rate, both from the technology side as well as the availability side. <laughs> what we see, and uh, I will be making the bridge with the previous now uh, speech, is that um, at this point in time, um, there is LNG which has accumulated uh, running hours that uh, level up into the millions. Um, we have also some experience on uh, methanol as an industry, um, ethane, which is a niche market, and the first LPG-fueled uh, uh, vessels are going to be uh, hitting the waters this year. That being said, um, there is going to be uh, a period where we have to gain some experience as far as uh, the next zero carbon fuels are concerned. Um, and these are the ones that you mentioned, uh, ammonia and hydrogen. Um, and there are challenges to be solved there in, if we want them to be brought on board our vessels. And um, that should be done in the context of, uh, uh, of marinizing them. Uh, and keeping in mind that all these technologies uh, are uh, going to be brought on a ship that is sailing in the middle of the ocean that might have another 10 days to see land. So it has to be safe, simple, and practical. Um, and there are a lot of details for every each of this uh, technology that needs to be addressed. And I'd be, I'd be happy to go deeper into, into this in this panel. Thank you very much. Yasun. Thank you. So I'd like to take a step back and say, okay, one way to tackle the target for greenhouse gases is uh, alternative fuels, but uh, there are also other ways. So it's, we start uh, from machinery systems. We can have a minimal improvement of five to 15 percent. 
then hydrodynamics, there is still some potential of 10%. Then we have logistics, things that are low-hanging fruits, simply operationally to improve, let's say, 15 to 20%, but the bottom line is alternative fuels. All the fuels that we have discussed in the previous, and um, in the, as George said, uh, the, the way we see it is that uh, there is no golden standard, so there is no alternative fuel that is um, matching every ship type and every ship size. And uh, of course, trading pattern can affect that. Uh, eight years ago, we participated in a project where we installed the first battery on an offshore supply vessel. This reduced 20% the CO2 emissions. And uh, another 20% from LNG as a fuel, it's almost 40%. Uh, but this is only for offshore supply vessels. When we did the study to see how could we install uh, batteries on a container ship, this was doable, but uh, you needed to replace 80% of your cargo with batteries. So uh, yeah, it's not possible for all ship types, at least with the current technology. And um, key part is that uh, all this uncertainty creates uh, all these um, uncertain parameters create an uncertainty, and uh, in order to, to go there, we need to have infrastructures. As Ms. Wright said before, infrastructures is key. Even if the vessels can burn ammonia, if you don't have bunkering stations, there's no uh, benefit from that. So this is why we always suggest that um, vessels should be flexible when it comes to fuel and utilize transitional fuels. LNG is a transitional fuel not only to reduce partially the CO2, but because it also enables vessels to burn other fuels in the future, like hydrogen, for example. And uh, another prominent fuel, like ammonia, it may be very hard to utilize at this moment uh, on board the vessels, but uh, ammonia is a trading uh, cargo. So there are already approximately 400 terminals around the globe where they can load or unload ammonia. And uh, this can be used as a foundation for the infrastructure in order to build a bunkering uh, network around the world for future vessels to burn ammonia. Okay, thank you. And I mean, the, the link between alternative fuels and infrastructure is, is very important. Um, but in terms of who gives the impetus for this and because th there are many different solutions. I mean, where, where do you also see the effect of this debate in terms of ship designs? Are you seeing, are you seeing a, a particular, the, let's say, the industry taking a, a particular direction on, on what would be considered to be ship de a future ship, ship design taking into account what what's being proposed for the future? Uh, yes, uh, as um, the previous speaker said, in the past year we've seen that all new buildings are at least uh, considering <coughs> LNG as a fuel. And even if they don't go for LNG as a fuel, they get this LNG ready thing, which means that they have all the infrastructure on board, so in the future they can easily switch to LNG. And they keep the key word for me for um, new buildings for the next few years is uh, flexibility. If a new building is, uh, how to say, has a fixed only one fuel source, then it's very hard to be competi com competitive in the future. Uh, I would certainly agree with the flexibility thing. Um, however, um, we have to look at um, how we start, and uh, I'd like I'd like to tap a bit on your first question on um, how do we transition, and um, so uh, I think that my colleague uh, has put it very nicely. You have things to start with right now uh, in in your journey to decarbonization. Um, you, you can start looking at the uh, energy efficiency technologies, you can start at uh, looking at the operation op optimizations. Um, but as far as the um, hardware you put on board, which is which going to be heavily related to fuel, uh, because what we see is that the biggest impact on decarbonization 
will come from the proper selection of fuel. Um, there are actual pathways that you can follow. Uh, one pathway is, uh, as uh, my colleague Jason said, um, uh, LNG. You can start with LNG and then um, in a flexible design you can start uh, looking at how that uh, design could go even lower on the carbon footprint. Um, there are discussions of uh, blending uh, fossil LNG with uh, bio or synthetic LNG. And then that in the future, if and when it becomes available, it could also incorporate some sort of a hydrogen uh, technology again. Um, on the other hand, there is uh, also the, the, the pathway to ammonia, which is through LPG. Um, and so that actually builds a matrix of short, mid and long term solutions that you can follow and that they create uh, practical, a practical approach to ship design. That being said, and I say my final comment for this round, is that as far as ship design is concerned, we have to take into account the fact that uh, some of the, of the fuels that are being addressed do not have the same energy content. And that should be also reflected in the design and the proper selection based on the business case. Can I just add, um, basically, I, I agree with both uh, George and, and Jason, what they, they mentioned, and I think everybody will confirm that this is a way forward. You have the medium, the, the short term, the medium term, and the long term um, uh, approach. Now, what we experience on a, on a day to day is that on the short term, low hanging uh, fruits, as Jason mentioned, there is still is a cultural change as well. It's not just I mean, shipping is becoming more transparent, is becoming more digital, and we see that uh, through, especially the digital era, you have quite a number of, uh, of clients of ours and generally operators that they are uh, much more cautious with regards to operations and fuel consumptions and so on. And this, of course, um, also comes very closely together with the plan of having the uh, arrival at port project coming up as well. So, so it's not just the operator, but also the ports and the entire infrastructure that will change our industry. And um, uh, there are a lot of projects coming up as well, uh, where um, the industry as such will provide the funding for research and development in our industry because nobody really knows what's going to happen in, in 30 years. We know the target. We have a good idea how to get there, but nobody knows uh, uh, where we are, and everybody is full of insecurities, really, on the future. If I if I could maybe open this up to the um, to our panelists who are from the, uh, represent uh, ship owning companies as well, because listening to this background about the potential technological solutions and the innovations which could be considered. Clearly, that, that has an effect also on your business and in terms of you know, how you adapt and how your companies adapt in order to, to, to meet these targets, both in terms of the, the current ships you have in your fleet and in, in terms of strategies involving ordering of new buildings. Listening, listening to this and, and knowing the industry as you do, what effect does that have on, on your uh, decision making right now? Joanna? Um, good morning, everyone. I think we have to um, take a step back and see what is the real impact of all of those regulations being proposed or all of these alternative fuels being proposed. Because we, when, when we decide on which um, solution we're going to use for our vessels, I think it's very important to look at it holistically. Because all of those not all of those, but a lot of those fuels being proposed at this stage are not um, sustainably sourced. Ammonia is produced from LNG, which is a fossil fuel, uh, from natural gas, sorry. And um, so it has to have a clear environmental impact and then a cost uh, a, a assessment of what it is. So a good um, solution is one that has substantial environmental benefits, but with minimum uh, disturbance and cost. So uh, you cannot create an environmental 
paradise on an economic graveyard. Um, so every fuel needs to, to be looked at and a wake, sorry, well to wake analysis, which is and from the point that it's extracted from the ground until it's actually burned on board the vessel. Um, we're talking about LNG. LNG, at this point, the, the LNG fuels around the world, um, bankering stations are only 2% two, two of uh, what is needed. You cannot go uh, sailing around the globe without having to stop at, with sufficient um, bankering facilities. So you can imagine when we're talking about alternative fuels that we haven't even um, come up with how long this infrastructure will take. Um, you guys mentioned a lot as well the low hanging fruit. I think from a, a, the lowest hanging fruit, which you've heard before as well, are operational, operational measures. Operational measures include slow steaming or power limitation. Um, by cutting 10% of uh, speed on a vessel, you reduce emissions immediately by 30%. If you take into account that you need extra ships for this, uh, for, to cover the same distance, it is a 20% reduction for every 10% that you cut on of speed. And this is not only for CO2, but it's also for SOX, NOx, and particular matter. So this is, when we're talking about low hanging fruit, this is the lowest hanging fruit. Um, now, in terms of um, the alternative fuels they, they, that was mentioned as well in the previous panel, there are a lot of operational measures and a lot of handling issues with them because you, there are, um, you need very low temperatures, some of them are uh, toxic, you need uh, the containment systems, also the energy efficiency content that was mentioned with, from uh, Yason. Uh, all of these are issues that haven't been addressed yet. So I think I'll put a full stop here so someone else can talk. Thank you, George. I, I would certainly agree with everything that Iona has just said, but uh, to go back to your question, uh, it's really two parts. So as a ship-owning company, we have two elements of running our business uh, of operations and then capital allocation and, and, and investment. And as Iona has addressed very well, um, you know, the first, and some of the other panelists, the first aspect is what are we doing day to day to begin to uh, to respond to this? And things are changing so quickly, as the previous panel said a year ago, we wouldn't be asking these same questions. So we are, uh, of, uh, of course, working hard to reduce our carbon emissions with the <coughs> steps that we can take, the so-called low-hanging fruit. Uh, we have an initiative in our company called Getting to Green, where we task or we challenge our seafarers on board and our masters aboard every ship to try to reduce their CO2 emissions. Uh, even in sort of uh, friendly competition with each other, and you know, it's what's good for 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 them and, and good for the company is good for the environment, and, and that's been a good uh, a good start. Um, we're confident enough in our ability to do that that we recently entered into a loan that has a pricing mechanism that ties our, our the loan price to whether we're achieving the CO2 emission decrease uh, guidelines that the IMO has published. So. Hopefully we'll, we'll get there or else we'll be paying a little more, but if we do get there and beyond, we'll be paying a little less. So I think that's a good start to beginning to put some real teeth into this uh, because the other thing that Claire, I think, mentioned on a previous panel is we need clear direction uh, from the regulators. You know, there's uh, the IMO has targets, but it's not yet a, a regulation. So I think we all know we're heading towards having to meet those targets, but it would be really helpful to have, you know, clear direction from our regulators and then the last thing, to go to the second uh, part of your question, listening to what everyone has to say here as a, as a ship-owning company, we are going to be very careful about investing money. I don't see that we are, you know, I think it was, the comment was made, we're not quite ready, you know, well, you know, it seems like we're still quite a, a ways away from ready before we would be comfortable spending a lot of capital on the next generation of ships until it's clear, you know, what's going to do it in terms of meeting these targets. So I think, uh, it, it, I think we will be, um, just very, very uh, careful to, to wait until the, 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 the direction of technology becomes more clear. Okay. Thank you, uh, Joanna and Jeff. And to move, to move on from there, because it's clear from everything that's been discussed so far that there is, there is a, a void that we are discussing new technologies without knowing what, what, how the regulations will be shaped, uh, what they will say, and also there's an issue of 
who pays for these um, uh, for these technologies. Now, the certain of the the ship owners' bodies have proposed uh, the creation of an international maritime research fund, which will be paid for through a, a two dollar levy per ton of fuel oil consumed by by each ship, and so that's one proposal. Other people have proposed, uh, there have been discussions about carbon taxes, which some people may view as being a bit paradoxical if, if we're looking to, to reduce green, greenhouse emissions, that people you know, should, should pay for this by polluting. What, what, are, what are your views on this, um, initially on, on that element, and then also we'll go into the, the regulatory framework and how the industry is trying to influence that. Can we, or Joanna, do you want to? I think when proposing a tax or a levy, it's very important to, to, to bear in mind what you want to be doing with this money because what they're estimating is about a five billion fund that's going to be um, created and a five billion fund is a big pot of money. So everyone will try and put their hands in it one way or another. So, of course, in order to bridge the, uh, the technological gap that exists at this stage between the technology of propulsion today and moving towards the decarbonization path, you definitely need uh, innovation to take and technology to make some leaps. For this to happen, money is needed. But the problem with all of this is who will use this money and how will this money be used as well? Do we, do we trust the politicians and the administrator, country administrations to, to, to have access to this money? And what do we actually think as ship owners will be the, uh, or as end users of all of this that is going to be imposed on, on fuel or as a carbon tax, whichever one they decide to go ahead with? Um, how efficient and how useful will this be? Uh. What uh, Joanna said is correct, but it's not five billion, it's one trillion US dollars under a recent study. If you want to go zero uh, by 2050, they say that there is about one trillion worth of research and development. Because if you see at IMO, they have concentrated on two major categories, the design and technical measures, which is the EDI that we use today and it's developing in phases and in the next couple of months they are discussing phase four but the majority of the contribution to IMO has to come from innovative measure fuel and technologies that they do not exist today so that there is no regulation there is no prescriptive regulation and IMO has moved to this goal-based approach where it tells you if you use a method that has the same equivalent result, then fine, use it. And the, the point is, I don't know if politicians need to be involved uh, to manage, but definitely ship owners, shipyards, universities, flags, uh, uh, different organizations, that they need to be involved in such, uh, if uh, such a major research fund for developing of alternative fuels. And by the way, there is no one single solution to go to 50% reduction by 2050. Uh, there are abundance. Even I am more recognized that th there are several contributes. Hull optimization can reduce 5 to 10%. Speed reduction can reduce certain percent for certain time because that will not resolve your long-term environment and CO2 emissions is a long-term issue. It's not like from today to go to 30, to go to 50. And what about after 50? I mean, we have issues. So. <clears throat> I think both now, the numbers you mentioned are concerned, but it's slightly different concept. I think the five billion uh, referred to you, Anna, is more the amount that will be received through the subsidy yeah. of, uh, of, uh, of IMO eventually, I through think. the tax levy. And this is it's a positive sign because it shows that 
the industry will find a way to, let's say, regulate the funding, and the money will be available for research and development. Um, the amount that of one trillion or so that was mentioned is, uh, there are different studies that they show that by 2050, this amount will have to be spent so that we, uh, we become totally carbon free. So um, I think we all support, or we should all support the, uh, the way of uh, some kind of centralized funding. And I think we, we will all find a way to participate uh, either in EU projects or uh, uh, funding from the USA or elsewhere that will embrace a new technology and a new um, uh, era. But at the same time, the IMO will find a way to regulate the way we are operating more strictly. And, uh, and I think the, the IMO, um, uh, the, the two dollar or two euro uh, levy will, uh, will come into effect fairly soon. Um, also this week in Brussels has been discussed how they will um, use this money and uh, the point of Joanna is absolutely valid that it's not just to have the funding, it's how it's actually been used. But at least everybody recognizes that there's a need to move forward jointly. Okay, and thank you for, the, um, for, the, for those remarks. Um, I mean, clearly, a key element which has come up here is, is regulations and the in influence of the industry uh, in, in shaping the regulations because this is, this is a seismic, it could be a seismic ch change to the industry. Now, especially in the context of, let's say, the IMO 2020 regulations and how the, the industry reacted to those, what, what steps do you think or is the industry or should the industry be taking place in order to shape these regulations because you are the people who in your different positions uh, uh, have either the technical knowledge the the operational knowledge how do, how can this all be combined in order to to shape regulations rather than having other people shape those impose them and then have an industry which then tries to, to fight against them or to explain why they are not um, capable of being implemented. Yes, Yorwood, you want to? yes thank you. Um, I would like to, to link my, uh, my response to Ms. Joanna Prokopiu, um, who mentioned about life cycle and how you should actually look at the decarbonization riddle by taking a, a holistic approach. What we've seen is that um, in order for uh, the industry to solve this riddle, it cannot be, uh, uh, on, the effort should not be only placed on the ship. That being said, you need uh, almost all the stakeholders of that value chain to be present. Um, so what we, we need actually, if we want to have uh, these new technologies and new fuels and um, new operational measures in place, uh, we need to have a round table. Um, what we also see is that there are um, regions that move faster than others. Um, just to tell you the example of MRV and DCS, uh, the European Union stepped a couple of years earlier than IMO in implementing that scheme um, and uh, it, it has already accumulated some data with regards to the consumption and emissions of ships. That being said, um, there was also the, um, as far as the European Union is concerned, there was also the, um, the idea of implementing some sort of, a, uh, of an emission scheme after the implementation of, uh, of the IMO, of the EU MRV. Um, so, again, I, uh, what we see is that the industry needs collaboration and clarity, also from the regulatory perspective as well. Can, can I say something on this, George? Yes. Yeah, I, I think um, we can learn. I, I'm not so sure, but I would hesitate to answer on how to shape the regulation. I'm not really sure how to interact with the regulators to do that, but, but maybe one way we, that us as owners could is by leading by example. I think 
if we look at what happened with IMO 2020, the first reaction of shipping was to complain about the possibility of this regulation and why is it on us? We're not, we don't historically make a big profit. The energy complex, you know, refiners and integrated oil, they have the money. Why aren't they regulating them? Well, they didn't. They regulated us. And, you know, but it's all working out. The cost is being absorbed and passed along and the air is getting cleaner. So it's, uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't the disaster that we, that, we, that we feared. And I think here in shipping, I, we feel, I feel actually a little lucky to be a shipping executive rather than say an airline executive. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what to do to reduce, you know, my consumption of CO2 if my business were flying jets all over the world, you know. But uh, in shipping, we have the opportunity, whether it's as simple as to, to steam slower or to take these first steps or then eventually it's going to be a technology that that all the, the bright people providing services here to shipping will, will give Yona and me a chance to invest in, you know. So uh, it, we have a really good opportunity to do a lot. So I think it's getting out in front of it and, and, and indicating the willingness to try, I think will help with, with, with uh, the regulators rather than, than to just complain about uh, why you're doing this to us. I think what is important is to have an open dialogue as, as we do as a company, but I think generally the ship owners to have an open dialogue with all the regulatory bodies, with classification societies, with flag states, with all the, uh, the, the, the people that have stakes in the shipping industry in order to be able to have a clear objective. And in addition to this, I think that it's very important to add at this point that we need to have uh, open dialogue with the environmentalists as well because nowadays we see they're gaining a lot of popularity in EU and worldwide. And in every solution that we do, implement, I think it's very important to have the input of the environmental groups, which is something that we, as, as a company, have, have started to do in the last few years, and it's proven very beneficial for us, and I think it's very important. The problem, going back to what you asked, George, the problem with uh, being reactive rather than proactive and in being uh, part of the, regu the regulations taking place or when they're shaped, the problem is that our industry is very fragmented and it doesn't have clear paths or clear targets and clear objectives. So it's very hard from our side to lobby, within quotations law, because nobody really likes the word lobby, but to, to be part of the, uh, when, when the regulations are formed, because the last thing we need as ship owners is to have those regulations that are proposed to be impractical um, unrealistic and clearly in many cases they are in the sphere of the imagination so it's very hard to to work in such an environment where we're constantly compelled as ship owners to change the vessels that we already have in the water and to keep adding more money to uh, upgrade and uh, promote different technologies on board so it, it is impossible to keep doing that because shipping is already a very risky business and it's very hard to, to keep changing the rules of the game while the game is already played. And this is something that the regulations and the regulators take into consideration because it is impossible for us in that sense. And this is, I think, one of the biggest differences with, between Shell for Cup 2020 and uh, the new regulation that now IMO understands the importance of the impact assessment and they have already discussed and agreed on a procedure to assess the impact of any new regulation on a holistic way, not only just the benefit for uh, greenhouse gases. And this is something that we should definitely keep in mind. And I do think that uh, what everybody said and definitely enforced collaboration among the different stakeholders. This is not an easy, there is no single solution how to reduce CO2 uh, with respect to the IMO targets for 2050. So there, we need more than ever, uh, and what Ioana said that about the fragmentation of the shipping industry, this is very true. I have a personal example uh, at the ILO when they were discussing the MLC. It was a tripartite agreement. There were the seamen unions, there were the flag administration, and there were the ship owners. But the ship owners were represented by the um, tugboat association. So <laughs> if that is a precedent of what can happen in the future. <laughs> can I just add a positive note? I think we should, obviously, we're all concerned, clearly, but 
I mean, it's a long way ahead, but also there is also a lot to learn from other industries who are, in terms of carbon footprint, they are ahead of us. So a lot of the technologies that we will be embracing at the end will somehow be related and already tested in some other industries. So um, it's not reinventing the wheel, but obviously it's, uh, it's also learning from others and adapting and so on. Can I, can I say something about that? The other industries, if you're talking about automotive or um, air, 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 airplanes, they have the uh, engine manufacturers doing their job and they don't have the end user being forced to change his engines, the way he burns the fuel, et cetera, to make all of these modifications that are very costly. And of course, in the, uh, the car industry is exactly the same. So I don't see why the shipping industry is penalized because of its fragment fragmentation, in my opinion, to, to take a stance and to, to invent a technology that they're actually gonna be using as well, when it's not the shipping industry's um, job to do that. We are the end users, we are the, the, the people that whatever the shipyard is providing, we always go and get the best one available. So why should we be the ones penalized for that? There is a technological gap that we, as from the ship owning side, cannot bridge. Joanna, I don't disagree with you, but I'm just saying we have 30 years ahead of us, and it's a long process to get there. And in all fairness, if, for example, you take the, uh, the hydrogen, mm -hmm. there are other applications in the industries that they are working with hydrogen, so I think buses and so on. But of course it's not the same, but we will not reinvent hydrogen. This is what I'm saying. Hydrogen is there already. We just need to find the application through the shipping industry. Andreas also. On a vessel and let it go. Okay, but given given the, you know taking Joanna's point about the perceived uh, weakness, let's say, or the fragmentation within the shipping industry, and given what's happened in the past, what what steps can the industry take in order to ensure that there is greater collaboration, that there is greater influence? Uh, on the decision making, and in terms of the people who will who will come up with these uh, solutions as well, not just the regulators, but the people who will develop and test the solutions. I don't know if someone wants to answer that. Yes. I can pick that up. So we 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 have already seen um, a couple of initiatives towards that direction. Um, in fact. Uh, next week in Copenhagen, there's the Getting to Zero Coalition. Uh, there is a global maritime forum. Uh, there are uh, initiatives that bring together different stakeholders uh, of the game on the same table. Um, that being said, um, and I'm pretty sure, uh, I think if you look at this panel, it is, um, it is a, a, a very small, in a small scale, what the discussion what is the discussion uh, in, uh, on, the, on the larger scale in the industry? So I'm pretty sure that if we um, uh, create groups in this uh, room after the, in the coffee break and have this discussion, that would be also the same way dynamic and even, even more so. Um, and that is what is facilitated in this kind of groups. It's bringing together all these stakeholders and exchanging views because we had, uh, I heard the operational measures, I heard the hydrogen being addressed, I heard uh, technologies that are um, already state-of-the-art in other industries being proposed for the marine industry. Um, so what is missing is actually how do we put that in place and make that work for, for our vessels, for, for, for the marine industry. And uh, in many cases that's not as, there's no straightforward answer. Uh, and uh, in order to find that straightforward answer, you need that sort of collaboration. Um, that also has to be reflected on a regulatory perspective, of course. Yeah, I, I completely agree from the owning side. You know, the, the things like the Getting to Zero and the Global Marine Forum, other, uh, other um, groups are being formed. You know, my the head of technical for my company flew from New York to London last night to be part of the Clean Shipping Coalition. Um, 
meeting there today. I know Starbuck has representatives there too. Others probably in the room. You know, we're we're all beginning to do that, and it's going to it's going to be really important because, as Yona says, it, we are fragmented. But if we work together, we can really uh, get something done. Okay, just um, uh, one last point because Jeff mentioned something inter interesting. As far as I'm aware, it's the only the only facility I've heard in terms of a, a credit facility where the pricing you said is linked to uh, the, the, the emissions of the ships. Do you want to give a, a little bit more detail? Well, it, the actual pricing mechanism will be disclosed in the, with the entire credit facility next week when we file our 10K, but the idea was that the Poseidon principles is a good start. Uh, the banks took the lead on that and, and uh, of course, some of our bank group, are, or most of them, are, are signatories of that, and we realize that it's important to, to get on board with the Poseidon principles, but they really only are, at this pay, phase, a disclosure mechanism. Uh, it's a disclosure mechanism that is quite thoughtful because it's anyway in line with what companies like Yonas and mine are doing anyway, which is to give the IMO, through our class first, the IMO, our, uh, the information on our CO2 emissions. But that's as far as it goes right now, is disclosure. So we and our banks took a further step to say, let's just put some teeth around it and make the pricing change a little bit. And I'll be the first one to say it's not a big change. My bank said it was because I already had got the price down so low they couldn't give me much more. But, <laughs> but uh, I'm not so sure. But, but, uh, but, it's, but it is important to, to take a step and use the beside principles. I think it's just the first. So probably people will leapfrog us and have other developments in finance. But we're proud that we, we were able to put something in place that, that actually does change upward or downward the, uh, the price we're paying our loan based on what, how we're doing with achieving the, the CO2 emission targets that are public, you know, part of the IMO and, and in the side principles. Thanks, thanks for asking. Okay, no, thank you as well. Well, I think it's a good point to wrap up because we have, we finished with one minute to spare. So Nicholas, we got you back on track. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and I'd like to thank all the, the panelists for their, the, you know, they're very clear and forthright views, and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.